Welcome to the Industry of UX number seven. In this episode, I had a great conversation with Kelly Lucas, lead product designer at Airship in Birmingham, Alabama. We talked about the differences and overlaps between corporate UX jobs and agency UX jobs, work-to-life balance in an increasingly demanding UX industry, and workshop facilitation. You can subscribe to the Industry of UX from your favorite podcast app, and you can check out theindustryofux.com for show notes, episode details, and to leave a comment and feedback. Also, check out our Ko-fi page at ko-fi.com slash theindustryofux if you want to buy us coffee and support the show with a donation. As always, let's dive right into the show with a question. How did you start your journey to UX? My journey is is probably not too dissimilar from a lot of people, um, but I graduated from high school in 2002, and I went to a small liberal arts college in central Alabama, University of Montebello, and I knew I wanted to do art. Uh, that was as much as I knew I wanted to do uh, for anything, but as far as the job market, didn't really know what to do with it. I ended up picking graphic design because it seemed like well, this could be a career path where I can make money doing something I, I enjoy doing. I had no idea what graphic design was. Could not have told you the first thing about what it means to be a graphic designer. But I went through the very first class and realized that I actually really enjoyed it. Uh, I was decent at it. Uh, it came kind of naturally. And I, I really enjoyed the, the whole process of it, you know, deciding what colors to use, what fonts, typography, learning all of that. And by the time I got out of college, I just realized, okay, well, this will be my first job. So I, I ended up getting a print slash digital graphic design job uh, straight out of college. And I did that for a year. And while I enjoyed it, it was a lot of what drove me to UX is, is part of the reason or part of the basis of having this job was I created something and I didn't know how it affected the people who saw it. Did they like it? Did they appreciate it? Could they find the things they needed to find easily? So I found myself asking a lot of these questions and not really getting the answers from print design. Uh, So I went through a couple of jobs after that that were basically digital design, but I ended up at a publishing company uh, where we created um, healthcare products for physicians, NPs, PAs, and through the process of that, we created internal web op- web applications for people to use to access this publishing material that we produced. And through the process of creating that, I felt like I could do the UI design just fine. That wasn't challenging. But what I found myself asking were all the questions that you would ask as a UX designer. Who's using it? What do they need to find? What are they trying to do? What are they trying to accomplish? What's the quickest way they can get from task A to task Z? And what I didn't know at the time was all of that is UX. I just didn't have the name. I didn't know that this was a whole industry. I just wanted to make the design the best that it could be. And so when I stumbled on, I think it was just an article that said, you know, user experience design, I started reading it and I just had that light bulb moment of, oh my gosh, th- this is what I want to do. <laughs> this is like the missing piece of this whole process. Uh, so long story short, that company was uh, acquired by another company uh, who had laid off all of their UX team. So I inherited several wireframes, several prototypes, uh, and they said, well, you know, can you finish this this product? Can you help get it launched? And I just fell in love. I absolutely loved it. Um, and from there, moved into a full-time UX role in a financial tech company, uh, spent three and a half years doing enterprise UX design for some pretty complicated um, financial tech products. And probably learned more in three and a half years than I could have possibly imagined. Um, just some of the most complex stuff I've ever worked on. Uh, and then from there, ended up in at Airship. Uh, I started as a kind of mid-level designer. I uh, got promoted to a lead uh, about a year ago. And it's just, it's been so fun. It's I get to work on a lot of the strategy piece that I've always been really passionate about. Um, I really like putting all of the pieces together, kind of looking at the, the higher level, how all of it comes together um, and being able to work and grow other designers and mentor them through some of the more, um, you know, encompassed workflows and stuff. Um, but as far as what I've learned through this process, I think just part of what drove me into this field was wanting answers, like wanting to solve problems for people. And part of that is talking to users. It's not just making assumptions and running with what you think is the prettiest design or the whatever, uh, the, mo- the design that pops the most. It's, it's not about that. It's about really solving problems. And I think part of what comes with that is the true UX side, the, the user research, getting to understand people and understand their motivations and their goals and having the data to kind of back up the decisions that you're making. Um, so that's probably the biggest thing that I've learned. Uh, also, that it's really important to 
find something that you're really passionate about. Mm-hmm. I've definitely had, you know, tough days as a designer. Um, but I think what really pushes me in those really tough days is knowing that the things that we do can have an impact on people and they can have a really positive impact on people. And I, I think that's very fulfilling. I also find that I really like solving complex problems. Uh, I don't like a day where it's slow, there's not a lot to do, or something's too simple. Um, I really like, you know, digging my teeth into something that's that's interesting and, you know, that that puzzle that needs to be cracked. Uh, so that's, that I think is the, the biggest, you know, bit of satisfaction that I get from this. Well, thank you so much for uh, sharing that with us. I, I find that really inspiring and we do have a lot of similarities in our backgrounds. And, and how many times have you been a team of one in UX? <laughs> Ah, oh, that's a good question. Um, you know, it's it's funny because the way that we staff at Airship, I'm almost always a team of one. Right. Uh, because with an agency, we don't have typically more than one designer on a project. So quite often in this in this role, at least I am. Uh, I was also a team of one when I was at FIS doing um, financial tech work. Uh, I was staffed to you know three different Scrum teams. I was the only designer. I was amongst other designers as as a team, but I worked on these products alone. So I definitely it, it's a big part of my background. I think almost every job I've had, I've been a team of one. See, that's really interesting. Because I've also had a lot of experiences as a team of one. And when you, um, I guess that the biggest team I joined is the team that I currently am on at Zappos. I, I rarely joined a company that had so many UX designers and a proper research team. And definitely when you have that, uh, there are a lot of benefits. But it's also nice to be a team of one. Uh, I can see the benefits of being able to move quickly, much quicker, actually. You have less processes that kind of hold you up. You know, you mentioned something something really interesting that, you know, you have been a part of, you know, that you're part of an agency right now. And that's something that definitely I want to learn more about. So corporate UX job versus agency UX job. Can you dive a little bit deeper in the different aspects of one versus the other, where they overlap, where they differ? Yeah, I, I think there's a lot more overlap than what people, I think, assume at the, at, at the start. Um, I think with when you're working as part of a product team, which, which tends to be more of the, the corporate side, I think that your subject matter uh, expertise gets a lot deeper. Whereas with agency work, you you tend to stay a little bit more surface level because of the speed of the, the process of working on these projects. Um, so I, I do kind of miss the side where you get deep understanding of the people and the workflows and the thing that you're working on. Um, part of me misses that, but at the same time, if you're one who likes to work on a diverse set of projects, that tends to not be maybe the, the area that you want to work in. Um, if you like solving lots of different problems and working with lots of different types of people, then agency work is, is probably the, you know, more of the area that you would want to lean in. Um, but I think there's pros and cons to both. I think it really depends on your personality and the type of work that you like to do. I think that you can tend to affect more change within an agency. You tend to be able to own, I think, more of the processes and the decisions that go mm-hmm. into how our product is created versus when you're in more of a corporate world, I think it's more of an uphill battle in, in yeah. getting, you know, if UX isn't a seat at the table already, you've got a lot of work to do. Um, the bigger the organization, the more work you're going to have to put in. I think the more times that you're going to be told no, you know, we're, we can't do research right now. There's not enough time. There's not enough buy-in. Uh, we know what we need to do. You just make it pretty. I think there's a lot more of that uh, that tends to happen at the corporate level, um, which can be unfortunate. But I, like I said, I think there's also trade-offs there because of the the speed or the lack of speed that, that tends to happen. I think you get to spend a little bit more time thinking about workflows and you're really trying out some different things and getting more input, more uh, iterative cycles through that. Whereas in agency world, it's, you know, speed is really the thing that you're working against the most. And a lot of these clients come to us with really tight deadlines. So we do the very best that we can to get their product out in the world in the deadline that they need. Whereas in an ideal world, if we could kind of pause for six months and say, okay, not even six months, like however long it would take to do proper research, uh, it would be really nice to, to pump the brakes a little bit and say, okay, we're going to, we have this one big unknown, let's dive into that and then let's build it. Um, so I, I think there's pros and cons to both, but I, I think those are the biggest differences that I see. How do you work with so many clients? 
Yeah, so part of our process at Airship is is we kick off every project with a discovery workshop. Um, those take place across two days, and much of day one is really just trying to understand the industry. Uh, depending on how complex it is, sometimes that can take longer than one day. Uh, sometimes it'll go into the second day. But we just finished a project with a logistics company and trying to understand shipping and acronyms and all of the things that go into complex you know, business logic of moving things across the country and tracking them and keeping up to date, it, it can be really challenging. I mean, some of these, you know, when you've worked on something that's like e-commerce, okay, well, those, those flows are very obvious to us because we use Amazon and we use a hundred different e-commerce checkout platforms. So we can tend to kind of derive the best designs out of those things, but it's entirely different to design something for a flow that you don't quite understand yet. And I think that's that's the biggest challenge of working with lots of different clients is there there really isn't that time to ramp up and kind of understand something before someone's asking you to design it. <laughs> so hopefully you get to the point where you design or you understand it enough to design something that makes sense. Um, but it's, you know, it's not easy. Uh, like I said, part of my job is running people through discovery workshops, which is, I think, the, the part of my job I love the most, uh, getting people around a table, which right now we're doing it remotely and we use Mural for that. Um, but getting to collaborate with people and pulling that knowledge from people who understand what it is we're trying to design. They may not understand how to design, which that's fine, uh, but getting their input and understanding that we can make an impact with the designs that we're creating uh, to make, you know, to solve the problem that they're bringing to us is is really interesting. That's interesting because uh, we have a similar process, but we use Miro instead uh, of yeah. Miro <laughs> yeah. to run uh, remote workshops. And so what is the the role of uh, user research uh, in, into this process? Do you have a separate team or are you tasked with running user research on your own? Yeah, if we are going to do research, it is done by a team of one. Um, sometimes that comes in the form of surveys, not necessarily my favorite way to do this, um, but where we found the most success at Airship is getting people to the table during a workshop. Um, so in our kind of pre-workshop conversations with clients, we tend to say, well, who's going to be using this? Can we get them in the workshop? And being able to get that real-time feedback rather than, you know, we're going to take two weeks and go do some research and come back to you and say, here's what we're going to do. Um, part of what I think the the plus in doing that is you have the buy-in right there at the table. They're hearing the feedback firsthand. No, I don't like this. This needs to be like this. And it's less of that where I think in a corporate world, a lot of times you're, you're kind of packaging up the research that you've done and convincing people that it's, it's the answer that needs, you know, the, the direction that you need to take. And I see a lot more success when you have the right people around the table um, to help drive those decisions and, and, you know, push the design in a direction that it needs to go. Um, we can't always do that, but that, that tends to be how we, you know, get the feedback firsthand without having to take separate time for research or delegate it to another team. Yeah, that's definitely that I can, uh, I can assure you that you're, you're right on the money with the corporate UX. Uh, there is a lot more uh, convincing stakeholders and uh, selling, your, selling UX. What are the differences, the differences that you have experienced between the day-to-day -day of a UX in corporate versus the day-to-day -day of UX in agency? I think the biggest difference for me is specifically the, the workshop work. I didn't have to do a ton of that in my last job. I did it a couple of times, uh, just really on bigger project kickoffs. So for me, it's we had kind of a like every other week cadence of kicking off these these new projects with agency work. So I'm getting a lot of experience doing facilitating and running workshops and kind of deciding you know discovery agendas and and that piece of it. Whereas I didn't really do that a lot in the corporate world. It was more of the hey, you have these two bigger flows that you need to design during this sprint. Uh, so it was a lot more setting up meetings with stakeholders to review design, setting up meetings with developers to vet whether it's you know feasible, getting user feedback loops in that whole cycle, doing usability testing. Um, whereas now we will do that usability testing within a project kickoff. Um, so within that you know two weeks that we're, we're doing this whole discovery process. Uh, but outside of that, I think the rest of it is pretty similar. It's okay. Well, instead of just doing these two, you know, flows and getting it vetted by the development team, then we're doing that just on a bigger project scale. So get more of those designs, you know, worked out, and then reviewing those with stakeholders or the the users that we 
you know, anticipate using them. So I think that some of the day to day isn't all that different. Um, and it really may depend on even the type of environment that you're working on. I'm sure that there are corporate roles who do a lot of the same thing that I'm doing at Airship. Yeah, there are definitely some uh, corporate roles that do that depending on the team that you're on, depending on the, the culture of the company. Like for instance, at Zappos, we do still have more of a startup ish feeling to our teams. So we do like to eat very quickly uh, and uh, have a more similar approach to an agency. If we bring it back to your day to day life, when mm-hmm. it comes to, you know, life outside of airship. So I've learned from your airship bio that you have quite, quite a big family. And, you know, for UX designers that are approaching the, the field, sometimes it's intimidating because you get all these people that share, people that talk about design, you know, and UX, they, they make it sound like once you get into UX, that, that's it. Like forget about a lot of your hobbies. Unless they are related somewhat to art, you can forget about it. Yeah, I think I think it's such a misnomer that if you go into any field, UX, you know, development, anything that it has to encompass your entire life. I've never felt like that. I've never felt like that about any job that I've ever had and that's not to, you know, bash any previous job I've ever had. I just didn't feel like it defined me as a person or that it needed to encompass my entire life. I have lots of things that I enjoy doing. Part of that is spending time with my kids. I enjoy going camping. I enjoy traveling. I enjoy a lot of things that have nothing to do with UX. Uh, but I, I do think that it's good to have a balance. Um, at the end of the day, you know, part of what does give me joy is spending time with my kids and getting to you know, help them experience other things outside of the four walls of our house. And to me, that takes priority over a lot of things. Uh, I know that there are people who are more than willing to put in 80 hours a week towards their job and find that very fulfilling. And that's, that's completely fine with them, but it wouldn't be fine with me. I, I wouldn't enjoy that life. I enjoy getting to do the things that I enjoy doing. And I think it's important for people he- to hear that that's not the only option. It doesn't mean that, you know, now that you're in UX, you only, you know, you have to write seven books and you have to publish 14 medium articles a week and you have to publish, you know, 17 uh, posts on LinkedIn in order to be seen as relevant or in order to be seen as a professional in this field. And I, I know that a lot of us struggle with imposter syndrome. I'm one of them, but I don't think that that's something that defines whether you can do a job or not. How much, how many hours do you put towards something every week does not define whether you're a worthwhile employee or the value that you put towards a company. Uh, I think that I squeeze a lot of value out of the 40 hours a week that I put into Airship. Um, some weeks it's more, some some weeks, you know, that's that's as much as I need to put in. And while I don't mind working overtime and I don't mind putting, you know, the extra work in when it's needed, I don't think that that's the default behavior of anybody. And I wouldn't want anybody on my team to feel like that either. I would feel terrible if my design team was putting in 80 hours a week because I would say something's not right in this process then. You deserve to have a job and have a fulfilling life that's outside of work. And I think that's perfectly fine. Have you ever experienced burnout when it comes to working in UX? Yeah, I, I do a lot. And it's, I don't think that there's any particular thing that I can put my finger on that says, this is burning me out. I think a lot of it is um, not getting to affect the change that you want to. I think that's the biggest thing that I struggle with. Getting told no too many times, I find incredibly frustrating, mm. especially when you see a better way to do things or something that's going to improve someone's life or just be, be, just be a better decision and then get told no. And it's just, it's so frustrating because oh. you can have the data, you can have the feedback, you can have everything you need to and just still not be able to do the thing that you know is best. So I find trying to recover from those moments very hard. Um, and maybe that's just the stubbornness in me and wanting to do the right thing. Uh, but yeah, that, that's really hard. I, I find that can be significantly uh, affecting my, my burnout feeling. Yeah. And to add on to that, to me, it's being told no without any explanation. Because even if it's a no, we don't have enough money or no, this, does, this is not making us enough money. It's, it's not a great answer, but 
it's at least an answer you can actually work with, right? Because if you know that, hey, no, because this is not making enough money or no, be, uh, because this is not converting customers enough, you know, especially when you are in e-commerce, you know, conversion is big. But so how can you still solve the problem, the, the user problem, but also hit that uh, vanity metric that they really want you to hit? So it's uh, that to me is the is key. But when you're told no, it's like they're, they're raising up this wall and what are you going to do with that? Yeah, I think that's a, a really great qualifying statement there. Uh, it's, it's not the feeling of no that frustrates me most. It's, it's no, like you said, in the missing piece after that, which is the why, right? That's our whole field is understanding yeah. the why behind things. And if you don't tell me the why, I just get frustrated. I don't, then you don't have anything to, to, to fight against. Now, if you come to me and you say, Kelly, we can't do this because like you said, it's too expensive. Okay, well, what can we do that still accomplishes this business goal, but in a cheaper way? That's, that is a way that we can turn that no into a yes. It's a yes, but this way instead of that way. Um, or, you know, no, because we don't have time. Well, what can we do in the time that we have that's better than what we have right now? There's always things that you can shift around and change that, that still, I think, accomplish goals. Do you have off the top of your head like a story in mind where something like that happened to you where you were told no, but you turned it into a yes, but? Oh, man. Probably every project we've done at Airship, honestly, it's always been a yes, but. There, there's always something that comes up in a project that you have to mitigate. Uh, most recently, we worked on a project um, for a company that does foundation work. Um, for, for homes. And what we really screwed up on was at the beginning of the project, we said, well, what's your budget? And they gave us our, their budget and we started working on it and we got to the end of you know this delivery period and we said, okay, here's what we've come up with. It's within your budget. And they said, ooh, no, um, that is within our budget, but we need it by January. And it was like, oh no. <laughs> uh, so we prioritized the wrong thing is, is what happened. So it wasn't a, no, we're not going to hire Airship to build this thing. It was no, that's not going to work with our timeline. So now what can we do? So we went back to the drawing board and shifted some things around and just basically repositioned the project in a different way that still got us to January. But then we had a, a longer term plan. Well, now by April, we can do all of this. And now, but by January, here's the piece that we really needed to prioritize uh, where originally we had said, you know, we'll have it to you by April, um, which we thought based on budget was the right decision to make. But it's, it's just an example of you always have to be ready to pivot. You always have to have solutions in mind that still fit a goal. Um, it's just that the goalpost might move a little bit throughout the course of the project, and that's to be expected. I think you touched on something really, really good, and I really wanted to expand on that, which is, you know, how <clears throat> do we convey the fact that, yes, we are all about advocating on behalf of the users, but we also, there is also business to run. Without the business, there are no users really. And so uh, some UX folks, especially one, the ones that, you know, land in the industry and they are fresh, they're uh, newbies, although newbies, maybe that's not the best word, uh, uh, novices yeah. into the UX world. Uh, they may think, okay, so as long as I advocate, as I personally advocate on behalf of the user, then I don't really have to care about anything else. In reality, when you talk to your stakeholders, there is also that business uh, aspect of it that they want you to bring to the table because they, although they care about the users, they also and primarily care about the business. And it's, I guess it's right that way. It's, it's perfectly fine, right? As a UX designer as a, or a UX practitioner, you're really like bridging that, bridging that gap, right? How do you bring value to both the user and the business? Normally that overlaps because users are happy, you're solving problems, business thrives. That's something that I don't think it's shared enough and we really we, a lot of uh, folks in the industry and you know i've been there too of course uh, where you get stuck with no i'm advocating on behalf of the users so my job here is done <laughs> i'm only laughing because i think the only time i thought that was my very first time yeah. creating a design as a ux designer and saying i have solved the problem now go do this and business probably laughed me out of a conference room somewhere uh, I think you only have to learn that lesson once <laughs> and you immediately realize that, okay, no, there are actually two boxes you need to check every single time you're creating something, which is, does it cover the business case uh, or the business goal? And does it also advocate on the behalf of your user to do it in the most 
effective way, efficient way, whatever the the basis of the user's problem is, uh, it needs to check both boxes. And like I said, I think you only have to learn that lesson once, uh, but it is a really important lesson, I think, for anyone who's new to UX. Uh, it, it can, based on the books that you read, the articles that you read, you can sometimes see it as, you know, rose-colored glasses. Like, I'm going to go in and I'm only going to do what's best for my users and I will never, ever, ever, you know, have to make accommodations that maybe don't feel great. And I think you have to get sort of comfortable learning that that's just part of it, but also advocating as hard as you can to do the very best that you can for your users. And it's not going to be perfect. It is never going to be perfect. In an ideal world, sure. Absolutely. But like you said, the, the business drivers are what keeps you in that role. Um, so you have to do your best to kind of, you know, straddle both sides and, and make both sides happy. That's, that is great. That's great insight. And I think that something else that you mentioned before that is really interesting that I would like for you to touch a little bit upon is facilitation. Because that's something that we are expected to do as UX practitioners, but that some folks shy away from. I am definitely an introvert that has to act extrovert, extrovertently. Well, that is an interesting English word. Let's say that it works <laughs> and we yeah. all understood what I was talking about. Yes. Um, so basically I have to put in my, in my head that, hey, okay, this is a facilitation session. I know that this is not necessarily my forte in terms of you know, talking to a crowd and get everyone to, you know, participate in an exercise, but then you do it once, twice, three times, a hundred times and becomes almost second nature. And now I, sometimes I look forward to this type of activity. And uh, how do you approach facilitation? Like what, what are your techniques to make it efficient and what are your techniques to prepare yourself to do it? Oh, that's a great question. When I first started at Airship, I thought that part of the workshop experience was I'm going to sit down and I'm just going to ask some questions. And what I very quickly realized is that you can ask questions for days and days and days and everyone is going to want to respond and everyone is going to want to talk. And by the end of day one, you have wasted the entire day and you have not gotten any sort of insights. You haven't tackled understanding the problem any better. You've just talked. So what was really key for me is, is really understanding what the purpose of workshops are. Um, which I, I went through the Nielsen Norman facilitation workshop, which was completely eye-opening, and I was not paid Same. to say that, but it was it was amazing. What I realized was those constraints that that you put into workshops is what makes them um, really helpful. It makes you produce things. You have tangibles that come out of that. You have action items. You have priorities. And what we weren't getting from questions was any of that. You can still ask the questions, but you need to put them in some sort of time boxed fashion. I think time boxing is really, really, really important. Uh, the biggest thing I think I've learned in the past year is setting expectations so that people understand what it is you're doing. So saying ahead of time, hey, here's what we're going to do today, guys. We're going to do this and then you do it and then you summarize it. Um, not doing those pieces leads people to getting to the end of a workshop and saying, well, I don't know, we did a whole lot of stuff, but I don't know why we did it. So you don't want anyone to come out of that and think, well, that was a big waste of time. We created a gazillion sticky notes and okay, now what? What you want them to understand is that each of these pieces of the puzzle actually contributes to building a better product. So I think it's, it's really important to understand how workshops function, what they're for, what they need to drive people to do. And then your job is to make sure that you don't spend eight hours asking questions and not getting anywhere. Your job is really leading the pack and driving people through these things, but not just driving them through them, like collecting people and grouping them, like, you know, school kids on a playground and getting them to hold hands and like marching together in the same direction. <laughs> that is the biggest piece of facilitation to me because you don't want the kid left on the playground way back in the back. You don't want one kid over on the slide. You kind of have to like hoard everyone together and, it's a big learning experience when that doesn't happen or you get to the end of day one and the main stakeholders like, well, I don't know. You guys didn't hear anything I said today. <laughs> you feel like you failed that and you have failed. If anyone feels like their voice wasn't heard or that you have not gained buy-in from everybody at the table, you have failed as a facilitator. And I think the sooner that you learn that, the better, because uh, it, it just makes your workshops more effective and you don't come out of day two with people saying, well, I thought we were building this thing and I thought we were going to build this other thing because it's hard to recover from that. It is very hard at that point to come back and say, okay, now we're going to get them together and we're going to do this thing. Yeah, that is a great point. And I think you have really 
painted a great picture of facilitation as a whole. And uh, I wanted just to add that last year, I think it was December of 2019, we at Zappos hosted a Google Design Sprint workshop with Jake Knapp, that oh, is wow. you know, the author of the um, of the book, The Design Sprint, and he is from Google Venture. So all the techniques that they use are really really great for facilitation one of one of the the big ones and, and i also wanted to know if you uh, happen to have seen notice this and if you use it but one of the big the big takeaways was to avoid collaborating to something as a group instead of uh, creating something let's say uh, creating post-it notes on your own and then reviewing them with the group Oh my gosh, yes. I think it's so important. I, you know, reflecting on what I was saying earlier when we first started these and we're just asking questions, it was always either the highest paid person in the room, the hippo, or the loudest person in the room who input everything. And you start to notice this as a facilitator when two or three of the other people at the table haven't said anything in 30 minutes, an hour, two hours. That's a really bad feeling because there's, there's a lot that can be said for silence. It can be frustrated, it can be sad, it can be happy, they can be thrilled that, you know, whoever is doing all of the speaking is saying all the things that they thought. But how, how often does that actually happen that if you were to talk for an hour that I would agree with every single thing that you said, it would probably never happen, just out of random chance. So I do think that it's, it's really important that people have to have a voice in this process. Like I said, part of, part of the biggest part of facilitation is making sure that you're getting buy-in from everyone. Silence is not buy-in. Silence is almost never buy-in. It's just silence. So you need to understand where it's coming from. So I think the benefit in doing those types of exercises, like you said, uh, you know, take a, take a stack of post-its and write your ideas down. We're going to take two minutes and stick them up on the board. What I like to do as a facilitator is, is do both. I don't think it's an either or. I think you can take some time to generate ideas by yourself, stick them up on the board. Okay, now take two minutes. Everyone walk around and read everyone else's notes. Feel free to add some more because it's going to make you think of something you haven't thought about before. And I find those moments to be, I think, quite insightful. There's a lot, of, even when I've been participating in a workshop and not actually running it, it almost always, you know, makes you think of ideas that you would have never thought about before. Um, there, so there is something for collaborating and sharing those ideas and, and getting to something better, but there's also something to be said for people. You mentioned you being an introvert. I'm also an introvert. I really appreciate quiet time to think about the things I want to say and the things that I are in my head and I need to write them down. I can't necessarily do that in a live conversation where someone's just asking me a question. I'll almost never give my best answer audibly. Um, I'm much more of a written form type person anyway. Uh, so I think it's important to, to kind of account for both of those when you're doing a workshop. Not everyone is going to be the one who's comfortable speaking out, but as long as you're giving them an avenue to participate, I think that is our job as a facilitator. That makes a lot of sense. I know you, you mentioned that you do mentor. Would you like for us to maybe shout you out as uh, open to mentoring? Oh, absolutely. I find this so satisfying because I wish I would have had it when I started in UX. Uh, like I said, I'm, I'm self-taught. I read as many articles and books and everything else that I could have learned. So absolutely, I love to share this knowledge with anyone else who's interested in learning. Um, it, I almost always learn, learn something from the people I mentor also. So I'm happy for anyone to reach out uh, Twitter or LinkedIn. You can find me there. Um, also on the Airship website, um, teamairship.com. And that's the end of my chat with Kelly Lucas, lead product designer at Airship in Birmingham, Alabama. Thank you so much for listening. You can subscribe to the Industry of UX from your favorite podcast app, and you can check out theindustryofux.com for show notes, episode details, and to leave comments and feedback. You can also support the show by making a donation on our Ko-fi page at ko-fi.com slash theindustryofux. Thank you so much for listening again, and I hope you have a great day.